On July 15, 2008, indie game developer Greg Lobanov, aka Banov G, uploaded Assassin Blue to the Yo Yo Game Sandbox. This was his second game on the Sandbox after 2007's RPG Wolf, but this game would come to surpass that one in downloads by nearly tenfold. Assassin Blue follows the titular assassin, Blue. I swear I'm not only making videos about characters with color names, it just happened like that. Blue works for a shadowy government organization led by a literally shadowy boss, and carries out his political assassinations to maintain their country's standing in an ambiguously turbulent region where the game is set. Blue often expresses that, by carrying out assassinations, he feels he can end the wars in the region, saving civilian lives in the process. The path forward may be paved with blood, but with my skill, I can end the suffering. We begin our first mission to assassinate the president of a rival nation and get right into things with an integrated mini tutorial, teaching us the basic moves of the game. It's an action platformer with jump, attack, guard, and special attack mechanics, as well as more complex combos that can be unlocked from optional collectibles. The first enemies we encounter are these ninja guys, who are not very good at their jobs, and can usually be dispatched with one slash. Sometimes we encounter their tougher ninja cousins, who require that we use a special attack to break their guard before killing them in one slash. After finishing the first couple of levels, we drop into a room with our target, the president. He asks if we know the last president was assassinated only a few weeks ago, but Blue doesn't care about politics. He's just here to do his job. As we approach to carry out our kill, the president reveals that he has been training for this eventuality and pulls out a sword to fight. The boss fights in this game are very well choreographed, typically following a pretty standard pattern. The boss will have a series of moves he uses to attack, with idle sections in between where we are able to whittle down his health. At about halfway through the fight, a short cutscene plays where the boss reveals a new move that is integrated into his pattern for the rest of the fight. Once we deplete his health bar, we must complete a quick time event to finish him. I know some people complain about quick time events, but the ones in this game aren't hard and serve as a way to have cinematic kills while feeling that you still have agency over them, rather than them just being executed completely in a cutscene. This element will prove more important as the story progresses. After killing the president, we return to the boss. Not, not the video game boss, we just fought our boss in the story, the shadowy guy. It's not confusing at all, I promise. The boss tells us that our next mission is to eliminate a senator from a neighboring country and to leave no witnesses. This time, though, we will undertake the mission with a partner. Another spotlight switches on revealing Red. Revealing Red. Blue is pretty incredulous that they're bringing in this new guy, and Red expresses the same sentiment. The boss explains that he's been splitting jobs between Red and Blue for years, but that this is the first time they're meeting. Red protests that he doesn't need Blue, and implores the boss to let him handle the job on his own, but the boss insists that they work together. The next set of levels are set in a jungle where the senator is hiding. Red immediately ditches us to go do the job on his own, which Blue is pretty unhappy about since he's the one who wanted to ditch Red. This level introduces a couple of new elements, namely climbing vines and these weird goblins for some reason, who are functionally identical to the ninjas from earlier. At the end of the first level, we encounter Red resting on a tree branch. Red accuses Blue of being soft and insults his extremely stylish cape fit. Blue rebuts that he is there by the boss's orders, so they may as well work together, which Red grudgingly agrees to, and the two proceed to the forest floor. This one gives the goblins grenades. Okay. Before long, we catch back up with Red and learn that the target is just ahead. It turns out that the senator is not alone, as he has brought his hulking bodyguard named Gunther. Red ditches us again to catch the fleeing senator, leaving us to fight Gunther. This fight has the unique characteristic of having vines overhead, which is good because if they weren't there, we'd be totally screwed. Gunther has an array of weapons including a machete, grenades, and... Sonic the Hedgehog powers? Eventually, we are able to best him and run into the next room to rejoin Red. We are greeted by a scene of the senator dead on the ground and Red standing before a woman and child. The senator, it turns out, brought his wife and son into hiding with them. Blue asks what they should do, and Red reminds him that the boss said to leave no witnesses. Blue refuses to kill the innocents, and Red shakes his head wearily. He knew Blue was soft. Blue runs around all day in a superhero costume, pretending that he's the good guy, but Red has no such illusion. He has a job to do. He approaches the pair, and the woman pleads for her life. Red only says, watch closely, Blue. This is how our job is done. And the screen is filled with red, and then fades to black. The first time I killed someone, I mourned for weeks. I was in the battlefield when the war was just beginning. I was 14. But as the war raged on, I found that I killed more and more each day. I slowly became numb to the guilt of murder. When Red felled that family, he almost seemed to enjoy himself. Am I fated to become like that too? The lights fade up on another meeting with our boss. He congratulates us and tells us that Red told him all about the success of our mission last week. 
Blue is taken aback, but plays along, and the boss moves on to giving us our next assignment. A band of revolutionaries are planning to assassinate him, and are holed up in the desert. It is up to Blue to eliminate this dire threat to the country by killing the revolutionary leader. This is a mission that he will undertake alone. The boss reminds us that he is putting a lot of trust in us for this mission. He asks if he can trust us. Blue says that he absolutely can. After he leaves, the lights come up on Red, who has been listening in the entire time. The boss instructs Red to follow Blue, but to remain unseen, and Red says that he understands perfectly. We open in a desert where Blue has found the tracks of the revolutionary leader. We progress through a level of goblins with grenades and knives, plus quicksand, and follow the leader into the mountains, where we find a cave entrance with the inscription, Here lies the great Emperor Xander, protected by the souls of the dead. Blue enters, confident it's nothing that he can't handle. The next level is a tomb. This one contains more strangely armed goblins, as well as introducing the game's first real puzzle mechanic, red-blue switches. I don't think this is supposed to be symbolism, but I think it'd be really funny if it was. After navigating the tomb and finding a rush of goblins for the key, we complete the level. The next level's boss is a giant stone head tomb guardian. This fight is markedly different from those we've had so far, as instead of dodging the attacks of a human to wait for his weakness, we must climb the walls of the tomb in order to reach the weak point on the guardian's head, which stuns him and allows you to get a few hits in. He also has laser eye beams and can shoot blocks out of his ears. Okay. After defeating him, he drops another key and we can proceed to the next chamber. Here we find the revolutionary leader. Strangely though, he seems to have known we were coming. He says that he got our letter and left to hide out in the mountains. When Blue demands to know what letter he's talking about, the man explains that about a week ago, he got a letter from the government saying that he was chosen to be killed, and so he ran. There's no conspiracy to overthrow the government and assassinate the boss. This is just some guy. Blue reads the letter and recognizes his boss's signature on it, confirming the truthfulness of the story. Blue recalls the way his boss asked for his trust and surmises that he must have constructed this mission as a test of loyalty. Blue lets the man live and turns to leave. When asked where he's going, he replies, I'm going to make things right again. After Blue leaves, Red enters the door. The man pleads that this was all a misunderstanding, but Red doesn't care. He does his job. I've already lost my parents and my brother to this war. I wanted it to end so no more innocent lives were lost. I can't believe the boss would make me kill an innocent man to prove my loyalty. I was blind to how twisted he is, but there's no time for regret now. I think I've come up with a faster way to end the suffering. The lights fade up on a meeting between Red and the boss. Red confirms that Blue failed to complete the mission. The boss says that Blue is too dangerous to let live if he is not on their side, and instructs Red to deal with him. Red nods. After Red leaves the boss's lair to find Blue, Blue drops from the ceiling, remarking that dispatching the boss will be a lot easier if Red isn't around to bother him. Right off the bat, this level introduces crumbling blocks, flamethrowers, and our first actually threatening enemy, Samurais, who have multiple powerful attacks and can block at will. In the second part of the lair, we must find three keys to unlock a large door, each one located on a different winding path. The first involves complex puzzles with the red-blue switches representing the struggle between the two assassins and their worldviews. The second area is focused on the crumbling blocks and involves a lot of insta-kill spikes that I could kind of do without, but it only resets you to the beginning of the room so it's fine. Also, this moment of a samurai pursuing you down a long shaft only to have the floor disappear out from under him and immediately being impaled is pretty good. The third path introduces these spinning Darth Maul lightsabers of fire, and also a cameo from a goblin. What are you doing here? Get out of here! Also, this guy just gets immediately marked by his own security system. Honestly, pretty sad. It's worth mentioning that, while the regular flamethrowers do one point of damage, the spinning ones are insta-kill for some reason. They aren't that hard to dodge, so it isn't a big thing, but it's kinda odd. After collecting the final key, we enter the door and you'll never guess what we encounter. That's right, it's goblins and ninjas together at last. We enter a long hallway full of portraits of a shadowy man, and finally enter the door at the end. We drop into the spotlight room, where we used to take missions from our boss. He asks Blue why he came, and Blue explains that the boss has done nothing but sow more seeds of violence in the world, and used Blue to do it. The boss shouts that it was never Blue's purpose to create peace, but to win the war, displaying an intimate understanding of Henry Kissinger's theories of realpolitik. Rest in piss. Blue says that he isn't the boss's assassin anymore, and the boss runs for it, still shrouded in shadow. Blue catches him in a dimly lit hallway and attacks him over and over again. As the boss finally collapses against the far wall, bleeding out, a darkened figure appears behind Blue. Well, this certainly is... unexpected, Red says. 
Blue screams that he will bring Red to justice as well, and Red says that if Blue wants a fight, he will gladly oblige, before slamming Blue out the window. The final level starts with Blue and Red landing at the bottom of a shaft outside the castle, and the fight begins. The Red fight is similar to the early bosses in the game, but he has a much higher HP bar and the attacks are much more powerful and varied. In addition to more normal attacks, he can also create waves on the ground that must be jumped over and do a stab rush that cannot be blocked. About a quarter of the way through the HP bar, we get a mid-fight cutscene. Red questions why Blue wants to kill him, saying killing him for killing people is hypocritical. Blue retorts that he doesn't need a ruthless killer telling him what justice is, and Red says that he doesn't either. The fight resumes, with all of Red's attacks slightly more powerful, and the introduction of quick time events that drain Red's health faster if you get them right, but damage Blue if you fail them. Once his HP is down to about one third, another cutscene is triggered. Red professes that the difference between them is that Blue has deluded himself into thinking that he will make things right, and Red gave up on justice a long time ago, when he lost everything and everyone he loved. Finally, Red says that he will see Blue in hell, and we resume the fight once more. In the final section of the fight, Red gains a new attack where he creates a whirlwind of blades, impossible to dodge or jump over, and that can only be avoided by wall jumping at the right time. Finally, after draining the last of his health, we get a final quick time event where we must mash attack to overcome Red's strength and disarm him. Red demands to know why Blue doesn't finish him off, but Blue says that he just wants to do what's right, and he doesn't even know what that is anymore. Red spits that murder is murder, innocent or not, you are still taking a life, and that him killing innocents does not make Blue better than him. All lives are equally worth taking. Blue thinks a moment, then turns away. Red is only half right. It's not that all lives are worth taking, it's that all lives are worth saving, even Red's. Blue vows to never kill again. Red, shocked that his moral sea lioning worked, pulls out another pair of swords and lunges at Blue's exposed back. The screen turns red and we hear the sound of a sword slash. Red's eyes widen as his severed arm tumbles to the ground. Sword glistening, Blue says, I may not kill you, but I can still make sure you never harm anybody ever again. Goodbye, Red. If I ever hear of you again, I'll take your other arm too. Blue leaps away, leaving Red alone. Credits roll. The main storyline is over, but there's still a little to do. Over in the bonus shop, you can buy a sound tester, some attack combos that can be used throughout the missions, a boss rush mode, and most interesting of all, a prologue called Blue's Past. This cutscene details Blue's childhood as the son of a master swordsman, and how this ensured that him and his family were among the first drafted into the war when it began many years before. In an early battle of the war, Blue made a careless mistake and his brother was stabbed, trying to save him. Blue ran home distraught to tell his parents, but found their village in ruins and nobody left alive. It was at this moment that he vowed to end the war at any cost, leading him down the path that we see him on at the beginning of the game. However, back on the battlefield, Blue's brother survived his wound and crawled back to the village. Finding it completely destroyed and razed to the ground, he presumed his entire family dead, including his brother, who he had attempted to save. Driven mad with grief and having lost all faith in justice, he went on to become the ruthless killing machine known only as... Red. This twist completely floored me as a child, even though as an adult it's not all that hard to guess as there is quite a bit of well-placed, if subtle, foreshadowing. Other than it being a bit cliché, I think it adds a lot of interest to the already pretty deep themes of this game and how loss can affect different people in different ways. On top of that thematic discussion, Assassin Blue also contains some surprisingly mature discussions of imperialism and foreign conflict, portraying a world where no nation-state really has the best interests of its citizens at heart, and how the wars fought between them are almost uniformly meaningless and serve only to expand the territory of their rulers at the great expense of human life. It's pretty neat. The action platforming gameplay isn't all that difficult, but it's quite fun and controls pretty well, some collision errors aside. It's very forgiving when it comes to dying, and that's always nice. Plus, as I mentioned earlier, the bosses are particularly well constructed and fun. That boss rush mode you can unlock in the store is a very enjoyable time. The graphics are an interesting mix of hand-painted backgrounds, which are slightly marred by the minuscule 320x240 resolution, but the sprites are expertly animated and have a neat, clean pixel art style that I really like. There are a bunch of little details in the animation that I love, like how when Red gets his arm cut off, his little pixel eyes widen in shock. I love stuff like that. The game is pretty short, so if you have a bit of downtime, I absolutely recommend you grab it from the YoYo Game Sandbox Archive or from DumbAndFat.com, the creator's website. Greg Labanov is actually still very active in the indie video game scene, being a creative force behind such games as Chicory, A Colorful Tale, and Wander Song. I'm sure we'll be covering more of his work in the future. As always, the links to all that are in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.